This video is brought to you by Knowledge at the Australian School of Business. For more information, please visit knowledge.asb.unsw.edu.au. In the past decade, the Indian economy has surged, boosting growth in a dramatic turnaround for a country where, up until 15 to 20 years ago, the economy had been little changed since the end of British rule in 1947. The economy of India is now the 10th largest in the world by GDP and the 4th largest in the world for purchasing power parity that looks at long-term relative price levels of different countries. But the question, is this a real boom or a bubble that could soon pop in a similar fashion to where the Asian economic miracle turned into the Asian financial crisis? Kaushik Basu is the Chief Economic Advisor to the Ministry of Finance of the Indian Government and also a Professor of Economics at Cornell University. So, Kaushik, can we really start with a little bit of the backstory? What happened to the Indian economy after India achieved its independence in 1947? For the first uh, good 30 or maybe 40 years, uh, the economy grew very little. Uh, very important things happened, happened on the political front the democratic structure was set up, and very, very successfully so. But the economy, no one would think of describing India as a success story for, I would say, up to the mid-1980s. We used to grow at roughly 3 to 3.5 percent per annum, the national income, and most of it would be swallowed up by the population growth rate, which was very high. So that growth came to acquire a name. It was called the Hindu rate of growth, jocularly by one of India's very eminent economists, that this must be something written in the scriptures, that India can never grow faster than that. That was a story which somewhere in the 1990s changed, and changed over a relatively brief period and very, very dramatically so. But yes, the early years of independence were uh, India was getting a lot of praise for its experiments with democracy, but very little for the economy. So can we put our finger on exactly when the change happened and what caused that change? Uh, I put a finger on um, uh, the early 1990s, so from 1991 to about 1994. But I think this is the predominant view. And it's easy to see actually what happened. In 1991, with the first Gulf War, Indian economy ran into a crisis for a very strange reason. At that time, India was not a very open economy. So a disproportionate amount of our money was what, in, what came in as remittance from Indian workers from the Middle East. With the first Gulf War, that source of money ran dry, and India's balance of payments situation was on the verge of going bust. When big reforms were undertaken from 1991 to 1993 by the then Finance Minister of India, who's now the Prime Minister of India, these were very dramatic reforms. And after those reforms, literally within a year or two, you could see the impact on the economy. 1994, India began growing at 7% per annum. We grew for three consecutive years at 7% per annum, which is double what I just called the Hindu rate of growth. That itself was a big surprise. Then foreign exchange reserves. India was used to a hand-to-mouth existence. $5 billion, India was used to that as the reserves. It started picking up in 1993, and within the next 14 years, it had reached $300 billion. Having been $5 billion for 14 years, over the next 14 years, from five, it went to 300. So things changed very dramatically after the reforms of 1991 to 1993. And yes, there is some controversy, but I think a whole a lot of observers will be with me in describing this as the sort of year when India broke out. The real fast growth really came in from 2004, five, but 1994 itself, it had picked up. So the, are there any specific reforms, anything you can really nail down as saying that was a real turning point, yes. that's what changed it? There were many reforms, but if I had to pin down, I would pin down two. One is India had a notorious industrial licensing system. So if you want to start up a firm, you need a license, and you will be given run for your money to get that license, with the consequence that new enterprise could not come up. 
Um, this was revoked in 1991. The licensing system was basically thrown out of the window. You don't need a license to start up a new business, number one. Number two, India has always, from the time of independence, we have been a very open, culturally a very open society. So we would get movies from Hollywood, we would get the newspapers, media, but we were not a very open economy. We used to raise our tariff rates and not allow foreign goods to come in. A dramatic bringing down of tariffs took place from 1991 to 1993. So opening up of the international sector was a major reform and um, the industrial delicensing was a major reform. There were other things, but I think if you are looking for the drivers of the takeoff, I would uh, point to these two. But bringing down tariffs was quite controversial at the time, and in fact now for many countries, they're actually looking at increasing tariffs. Is there a lesson that the rest of the world can learn here between a country with tariffs and one without? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, the advantages of a crisis, I mean, there are things you can do during a crisis which you would not be able to do at another time. So, no, I mean, I'm in no two minds about the need to bring down tariffs and keep them at a very low level. You want trade to be as open as possible. And India did that. So I think f this is for all countries. It's worth doing that. Very often it's tied up with currency flows. Do you open the gates to currency flows fully or not? And here I should tell you, India has restrictions on that. So we allow current account flows, but huge capital movements, there are some restrictions. And this combination is working very well for India. Open up the trade, lower the tariffs, keep some restrictions on capital flows. You don't want destabilizing inflow and outflow of currency, but with a lot of openness. But I mean, you're going to study your spending, which if you're going to the US to study, you're going to take quite a bit of money out. All those you have no problems. But if you want to invest in another country or you want to let investment into this country, there are some restrictions still on that. So that's really the mix of currency restrictions that we operate under. And if we look at growth now, then GDP in India is powering ahead quite strongly. If you look at purchasing power parity, India has now got up to number four in the world, which is a bit of a surprise for, for many people. It is a surprise even for Indians. I mean, I remember when I began um, as a professor at the Delhi School of Economics in the late 1970s, 1978, even early 1980s. We would be proud of uh, India's political experiments, but no one really thought that the economy is something that you talk about. And we were reconciled to the fact that that's the way it's going to be. It'll be a vibrant democracy with a slow chugging growth. But you no, know, the story changed and India is talked in terms of the growth leaders in the world, which really 15 years ago, we couldn't imagine uh, India being described along those uh, lines. And the figure that you just gave is um, gross domestic product where India's fourth or fifth, somewhere very high up there with PPP correction. That, I have to say, part of that is the population as well. I mean, we are a big country, um, so the population adds to that. But when it comes to per capita income, it's still a country which is down there, but just picking up, it's the growth rate is just phenomenal. But also picking up, look at inflation. It's almost the sort of Western disease now feeding into the Indian economy. And inflation at the moment, 9%. A year ago, it was up at 16%. Now, that gets to the level where most economists do get a bit twitchy. Yeah. So the inflation has been the big worry. But just to put this in perspective, emerging economies have had inflation which have run to 1,000%, 2,000%, Latin American countries. And by the way, I mean, the, actually the biggest inflations are Europe in uh, between the two world wars and after the world war, uh, huge inflations. Compared to that kind of history, this is really nowhere. But India is a country with very low inflation historically. So once inflation crosses 10%, politically it gets very destabilizing because the poor and the vulnerable begin to feel the pressures of the prices. However, you have to keep in mind, take last year, India's nominal income grew by about 20%. Inflation was 11%. So inflation took away from that, but it still left 9% as real growth. More food, more clothing, more housing. So there is this cushion of real growth which is allowing us to tolerate a level of inflation which earlier we would not have been able to do. Having said that, one of the biggest challenges for government right now is the challenge of inflation. I mean, no two ways. I mean, a disproportionate amount of my time gets spent in India uh, talking, thinking about uh, ways to tackle the inflation monster.
And indeed, the OECD, they've very recently produced a report looking at the Indian economy, and there they do actually say inflation is going to be a worry, and there's a, quite a lot of fiscal tightening. Is India in the position, a, a very lucky position that many countries aren't, where you've got rising inflation, where you can actually clamp down on it, or alternatively, is it going to gallop out of control? No, I don't think so. Actually, um, the inflation is bad enough now, but I think we are seeing um, the uh, worst of inflation behind us. In fact, one year ago, as you just mentioned, it was much higher. It's already come down. So I think the trajectory is right. And over the last year and a half, our central bank has acted nine times to tighten liquidity. The Ministry of Finance, which is where I am based, we are working on tightening our fiscal deficit. So the two are going very much in tandem over about a year and a half. And the slowing down of inflation that we have seen over the last year I think it's a response to these policies. So no, inflation is bad. Uh, inflation is going down far too slowly for my comfort. But I don't think there's really any question of it uh, galloping out of uh, control. However, there has been some speculation because people have seen what happened, say, uh, with the Asian financial boom that suddenly turned into an Asian financial crisis where there was a whole host of deregulation, where the currencies were allowed to float and the thing just galloped completely out of control. It yeah. did turn into a great big bubble. Is there a danger that the Indian economy could be in a bubble situation? There are certain parts of the economy where a bubble can arise and it would be foolish to say that that can't happen. For instance, housing market. We are not in a bubble, but a bubble can form and a bubble can burst. And we've seen this in the strongest East Asian economies, 1997, that's what you're referring to. No one would have expected that, but that happened. But any good economist should expect that, yes, segments can get into a bubble and collapse. But if you're talking about the growth story of India, there again, I don't think it's a bubble at all. It picked up in stages. It picked up first in 1994, went into 7%, stayed there, slowed down a little bit during the East Asian crisis. It broke into 8% in 2003. And by 2005, the growth was at 9% which is astonishingly high, but it was there for three years till the recent uh, global crisis. It slowed down a little bit. Even in the middle of the global crisis, when most countries in the world, GDP was actually shrinking, it was negative growth. India's worst year was a growth rate of 6.8%. So I feel the growth story is here to stay. I mean, it's been with us for 15 years and we are going to live through that, but there will be Segments which will, bubbles will form and bubbles will go. We try our best not to let that happen, but we know we have to live with some. Well, I'm sure there are many countries where they'd love to see a growth rate of 6% and uh, for it Absolutely. to actually be a long-term low. But at the same point, the OECD in, in their recent report are again saying that they would actually like to see a little bit less regulation. They would like to see the markets freed up even more. Is that possible in India? It certainly is something that we should go for. So I, I am with the OECD uh, on this. And even within India, if you look at the debate that is taking place, there are important areas on which we have restrictions currently, but there is talk about opening up. I'll give you one sector where I've been a part of the debate. Retail outlets. India does not allow multi-product retail. The big companies are not allowed to uh, operate in multi-product retail. Walmart can't be there, Tesco can't be there. But there is now a discussion and a debate that this is a segment that ought to be opened up. You allow foreign direct investment to come and big corporations will come in. Now, I don't know whether it will happen, but this is being debated. It's very likely. Likewise, there are several areas of reforms where I think a lot of the Indian opinion is going in a direction that OECD is talking about. So this is not, does not come sort of as a surprise to what is being talked about. But yes, there are indeed important reforms still to be undertaken. And finally... What can Australia learn from all of this? What can it learn about freeing up the markets and having less regulation and just a free market economy? You know, Australia has done very well. I mean, among um, industrialized countries, Australia stand out, stands out in somewhat of a similar way that uh, India stands out among emerging economies because you're liberalized from about 1985 or so. Australia began liberalizing and it's, it's seen actually a lot of the advantages of that and likewise for India. But the general story, I think, has to be kept in mind that trade is worthwhile opening up trade and allowing that to happen. You need regulation. You can't run a modern economy without government regulation. 
but you have to keep it moderate. You don't regulate a sector out of existence. Earlier, the mistake India would make is that you see some evil in a sector and you you try to regulate it, but you regulate it so much that the sector goes out of existence. That's the kind of thing that you have to guard against, and that's true for India, that's true for Australia. Kashik Basso, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julian. For more business news and analysis from Knowledge at the Australian School of Business, please visit knowledge.asb.unsw.edu.au.